and we are recording now. So over to you, Lisa. Great. Thanks very much, Rob, and thanks for the invitation to talk at uh, today's webinar. Uh, always happy to, to get out there and promote the work that we're, we're doing in the library. So I'm going to be talking uh, today about our Let's Online Information Literacy tutorial and how we've increased engagement with Let's uh, by really, uh, I suppose, uh, levering, uh, leveraging a couple of features within Moodle, uh, namely using the H5P software and also um, enabling the subcourse feature. And I'll, I'll get on to that kind of later on. So in terms of where it aligns to the European framework for digital competence, uh, it's a couple of key areas that it aligns to, uh, namely area three and area five. And I've kind of highlighted those specific areas there as well. So you could have So I just I thought it'd be useful to give a bit of the context to why we developed an online information literacy tutorial before I go into some detail in kind of talking about the, the tutorial itself and, and how we've developed that. Um, so <clears throat> firstly, just to say that we've been active in that teaching and learning space for, for many, many years. In fact, a team of librarians uh, from DCU Library were the first recipients of the DCU President's Award for Teaching and Learning uh, in the late 90s for their work on information literacy. The majority of work uh, and the majority of information literacy <clears throat> uh, delivery is curriculum based. So in other words, we work really closely with our academic colleagues to identify where information literacy learning outcomes exist in their curriculum, in their uh, modules or programs. And that's where our intervention is, is, is kind of at that level. So very early on, we realised that that's kind of not sustainable on, 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 a, on a large scale. So we kind of really wanted to extend the reach of our information literacy programme and to enable self-paced independent learning. So that's why we developed our online tutorial in the first place. Uh, and now it's currently used to support uh, our online and blended delivery. And it just while I was kind of preparing this, it kind of brought me back to when we first started uh, uh, preparing um, and planning for developing the tutorial. And the, the library literature certainly at the time was kind of indicating that uh, generic um, online information literacy tutorials weren't necessarily the most effective, but because most of what we did was curriculum based already, we thought we really needed something that kind of filled that gap and kind of students were falling through the gap. And obviously we followed the kind of best pedagogical guidelines to develop it. So what actually is our Let's tutorial, um, um, our library e-tutorial for students? Well, it's a series of 10 short self-paced online tutorials with students in which students learn how to locate, evaluate, use information in an effective and ethical manner. We, we really aim it at that early level undergraduate, but it can also be recommended as a skills refresher for like uh, later years or, or kind of thought postgraduate students as well. So just to give you an idea of what, what's contained within the tutorials, is that all of the content has been written by our team of subject librarians and um, it's kind of done very much in the DCU context so what a DCU student uh, kind of their landscape is in terms of, of information and engaging with information resources so it, it's written by our own team of librarians. It has a number of kind of interactive elements to, to increase engagement um, so the, the first one of these being our videos so we've several videos some of them are interviews or kind of talking head videos that uh, are with DCU lecturers and DCU staff. And others are those that have been created by ourselves and um, that ad address a specific learning need. And probably our most popular one is our avoiding plagiarism with citing and referencing. We also use these videos uh, in, in their own right as kind of reusable learning objects, both within face to face in the classroom when we're, when we're meeting students and also to kind of push out content to students through various different means. We've also got a number of activities and again, a different ways to engage uh, the students along their kind of interaction with, with the tutorial. Um, some of these we've kind of created ourselves and others are built into the H5P tutorial software. And the, 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 I suppose the aim of these is to so that students can also test their learning uh, along the way. And these will be done in a more in a, a formative sense, not in a summative sense. So we also have got 
our summative elements. So for lecturers that wish to set this as a, an assessment piece, so have students take the tutorials, we have an additional uh, set of loop uh, Moodle questions and quizzes that we set. You'll hear me saying loop and Moodle throughout. I'm referring to uh, DCU's uh, iteration of Moodle, which we, which we call loop. Uh, so uh, yeah, so lecturers can use these quizzes to set, um, to, to basically set summative assessments for their students if they wish to as well. Students can come to Let's in a variety of different ways. So obviously it's hosted on Loop, so they, they, can, they can access it in that way. But we also have links on our library website. So if you're looking to answer a specific question, they might come to it through uh, various different uh, ways on our library website. Lecturers sometimes will recommend it. So lecturers that know about it uh, uh, want to recommend it to their students. And I'll come back to that kind of whole uh, lecture kind of piece uh, uh, later on. And also through recommendations from ourselves or the subject librarians when we meet with students in classes. And it has allowed us to do kind of, kind of flipped classroom activities as well. So we get the students to go off, have a look at something on let's and come back and discuss it when we get to meet them face to face as well so and also it's used by our information services team so uh, at the information uh, desk or through uh, interacting with students through email uh, if they feel like let's would help support them in a particular task they can recommend let's uh, to the students in that way so students can come to let's from a variety of different paths So I just thought it'd be useful to, before I kind of explain a little bit about kind of H5P and, and how we've used that, is just to, to tell a little bit about the story of Let's and how it developed and how we come to, to choosing H5P as our platform, uh, which we currently use for our online tutorial. Let's was first developed in 2008, and it was actually through project funding, I think we received even, it could have even been a year or two earlier. Uh, so it was originally developed to be an OER, and the, the, the first version of Let's was actually a web-based tool. So it consisted of HTML and flash objects, which we had developed by former students, uh, media students in DCU. The content, uh, as I mentioned before, was written by our subject team. And we also used the funding to develop a logo and branding to go along with it. So this was one of the good things about it was that it was easily updatable, uh, but that was more the HTML content rather than the flash objects. At the time, we didn't have that expertise that would allow us on the team itself to update those flash objects. So they did become out of date kind of, you know, I suppose fairly quickly. And also we had limited analytics associated with it. So in 2013, um, we fully revised all the content and converted it to the articulate storyline tutorial package. I'm sure some of you have used that uh, in the past as well. We had used it on another project and that's how we kind of came to, to, to know about it. It allowed us to really uh, increase the amount of interactive elements that we had within Loop uh, within the tutorial itself, sorry. Uh, and it's when we first began hosting the tutorial on Loop Previous, it sat on the library website, and this was the first time we began hosting on its own page, so the Let's page on Loop, and when we first developed those kind of Loop quizzes to go along with it. Uh, we had requests from several lecturers for this to be kind of embedded on their course or used on their own module page. And so how that basically worked was that the object itself was uploaded to the lecture page for them to uh, include it as a SCORM uh, package on their, on their Moodle page. But this led to kind of issues around updating and version control, because if we wanted to update something on the main tutorial, it meant that we would have to update it where it existed everywhere on somebody else's page. So it did lead to kind of issues around version control. So in 2018, when Mark Lynn from our TEU came uh, to show us H5P, we were all over it from the beginning because it really looked like it was going to address some of the issues um, that we'd been having. Uh, already it would have greater integration because it was created, the objects were created and hosted within Moodle. And it would allow us to create more interactive and visual elements and also get those kind of enhanced kind of analytics. So be able to, to track things a little bit more. And the biggest I think thing was that it would give us the opportunity to have a single centralized version that was instantly updated whenever we wanted to make changes. We also used it as an opportunity to make some other uh, changes to the tutorial. Uh, previously, there, there was three larger kind of um, 
uh, objects, uh, learning objects. So we decided to cut them into more bite-sized chunks um, that address kind of the frequently asked questions uh, that we were receiving from students. So we used it to update our content, create new videos and add feedback. So at this point in time, when lecturers wanted to add it to their pages, we were simply including it as a, a URL back to the main Let's page on Moodle. Um, but it proved to be really, really popular. So in 2020, so summer to, uh, 2020, uh, I approached uh, Suzanne in TEU, who I've worked really closely with on this with, with some other colleagues in, in the library and TEU as well, um, to really kind of set out that criteria that we had for moving Let's Forward. So essentially what we wanted to be able to do was to maintain that one centralized version of the tutorial on the main Let's page on, on Moodle. What we wanted for lecturers to be able to uh, embed it on their page, because increasingly we were being asked if they could make it a compulsory element of their module. So they wanted some way to be able to track their own students interaction with the tutorial as well. But we wanted to still maintain that kind of oversight on all interaction with the tutorial, whether it was through embedding on a, a specific uh, page or coming to it via the library website or whatever it happens to be. So uh, after many conversations and emails and a lot of testing um, between ourselves and Suzanne, uh, this is what we came up with, which was to set course completion criteria and to enable the subcourse settings. So to set let's up as a subcourse. So I'll go into that in a little bit more detail here. So the first thing is the course completion criteria. So for each of the 10 mod, uh, tutorials, what we did was we had to individually go in and set course uh, activity completion uh, criteria. In other words, the student would have to view all of the, the content, uh, to view the content and to also take those uh, formative um, questions uh, and get at least 50% on those to be considered completed. They can go and retake those questions as many times as they want to until they get them right. So really achieving that is actually is not that difficult, really. Um, and then we have our overall course completion. So anybody that would complete all 10 of the modules would get would get a little tick at the end um, so they could see that. The second thing is the subcourse. So once we got all that done, uh, the next thing was to look at setting it up as a subcourse. So this was the recommendation from Suzanne and we tested it and we were really, really pleased at how it works. So this would enable a lecturer to go to their module page and add an activity or a resource, choose subcourse and from that they would be able to select let's. So this would automatically register all their students on the course and to be allowed them to take all the modules and for the lecturer to be able to see if they had completed them at the end. So that was a really key thing in kind of getting this uh, part of it off the ground. Uh, in terms of what a student will see, they would see less on their own module page and they would see their progress on that particular course as well. So this really, I, I worked out really, really well for us uh, and particularly in the year that, that we're in now in terms of um, request for, for online uh, engagement and interaction. So uh, how it's worked out this year so far is that we have embedded it in about 18 modules across nearly all of our faculties. Um, so that means it was a compulsory element of those modules. Some of the lecturers chose to give marks for completing uh, all, all of the, the courses, whereas others, it was just, it was, you know, it, it, it was just a requirement and they maybe set an additional loop quiz uh, alongside that. So 1,200 students, uh, over 1,200 students completed all 10 of our tutorials. So we're, as I say, we were very, very pleased with that level of engagement. We suspect that these 1,200 students were probably those that have, had been embedded in their module. So it had been made a compulsory element to complete all 10 of them. Um, and of the 2,300 plus students that accessed the course and completed at least one, and in most most cases, it was more than one module. We suspect that those were made up uh, of students that came to it through uh, accessing the library website or through other paths uh, to let's. And just some final observations. Really, um, we we kind of were, were very pleased with how successful this has been and how successful let's has been in general uh, in delivering our information literacy program. And we really feel that that's been 
because we've continued to develop it over the years um, and following best pedagogical practices, obviously. Uh, so, you know, we, we've kept it relevant. We've kept it up to date. We haven't just let it sit there in the, in the corner. We've really, you know, put the work into it and kind of reinvented it as, as we went along. Also, it's a real team effort in terms of the library team. So um, as subject librarians, we each have our own schools and faculties for, for which we liaise with and deliver our inf information literacy to. So it's really important for something that supports all of our efforts that we all had some kind of ownership or involvement in it. So we all contribute to the content and we all contribute to keeping it up to date and to promoting it and in, in that way. So really, I think that's been a key factor in its success over the years. And just in kind of stepping back and looking at it when I was, was, was preparing this presentation, I kind of realized how we kind of come full circle. So we originally developed Let's to reach those students which weren't getting those embedded uh, classes and in fact now it's being used by uh, by academic staff to embed information literacy in their programs and modules so it's kind of come very uh, full circle in that regard and lastly just to say we do plan uh, some future updates so we continually keep the content up to date which is really really important we also want to explore uh, certificates so giving a certificate of completion to anybody that has completed um, all 10 modules and just add more interactions and videos and you know continually keep those up to date and I'll just finish with a little bit of feedback from students and um, so obviously you know we're, we're happy with the numbers and the level of engagement and through our interactions with our academic staff but also really uh, it's the, the student voice is what's really important so we're very heartened by uh, the, the feedback that we received um, for let's you know students finding it informative uh, and interactive one student saying they, they find they were more confident uh, and were able to apply things uh, successfully and a, a particular one that uh, tickled me was a, a student that liked our father ted example there as well so uh, always good to get student feedback so that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation so uh back to you rob now if if you want recording so we're recording again now and it's over to you Kira. Good afternoon everyone. Can I just check can you hear me okay? Super. Yep. Um thank you Rob and uh thank you everybody for joining us here today. I've been delighted to be asked to attend and to speak to you today about how I've been using podcasts particularly over the last couple of months um to account for alternative types of learning namely asynchronous learning for our uh, students in the Marino Institute of Education. So um, to begin, I suppose, just to give you a little bit of flavor as to how I'm interested or why I'm interested in this area. Uh, prior to taking up my current role in higher education, um, I was a primary school teacher myself in a Desh Band 1 school in, in Bray in County Wicklow. Um, and when I was in the classroom, I utilized podcasts um, in order to embed digital practice in my, my teaching and learning technique in the classroom. And originally it was very much teacher led. So I would have worked with the students to primarily, I suppose, improve their oral language um, um, approaches and technique, vocabulary, delivery, all of that. But then it very much became the fact that I took a backseat role and the students themselves uh, started to record their own podcasts. And we created our own podcast channel on SoundCloud and we would have recorded podcasts about school life. We would have captured their learning, doing reflective reading logs. They would have done quizzes. Um, the student council and green school started making little podcasts and recordings and making them available within the school and then within the wider community hosting them on our blog. So this is something that I've utilized for a long time and I found podcasts were really impactful there in that context because the students who maybe might have struggled to access the written word found that they found their own voice through podcasting um, and then also I suppose it was quite celebratory in tone and it allowed for us to capture the student voice and to share that with the school community so this is something that I've been interested in for a very long time 
So that leads us to where we are today and today's presentation, where I hope I can kind of contextualize, you know, why we, we went down the podcasting route in Merino. Um, uh, podcasting in a time of COVID, I, I really think it should be banned now. Blank in a time of COVID is a phrase we've all heard far too frequently over the past couple of months. It's almost as hateful as that pivot word, which I've now banned. There will be no more mention of pivot. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I want to reflect also on how we did it, uh, what we learned from the process and reflect also on how it might work for you. But also, um, as you'll see from my presentation, I was using a lot of external tools that I was then embedding on Moodle. But I'm very interested to hear from other people who are using particular plugins, perhaps to incorporate use of podcasting or audio recordings within their Moodle pages. So I'd love to learn from you also. So initially, to begin with, you know, why podcasting and where does it fit into what we're trying to do? So to give you a little bit of a background on myself, um, I, I lecture across various education programs in the Marino Institute of Education. But this semester, I actually am working across all of our teacher education programs. So I'm working with the second and third year um, Bachelor of Education students and also our um, our, our PME students, um, professional masters in education students. So all of the students I'm working with will themselves go on and, and, and teach in the primary classroom. So I, I always try to, of course, present anything that I'm doing with them as I am demonstrating the use of the tools for the purposes of supporting them in their learning, but also in the hope that I am showcasing opportunities for them that they will then go out and try out these techniques themselves in the classroom. So it is very much one foot in, in my own computer lab or in my virtual Zoom classroom, but also with a hope for them to, to find their feet in the, their own primary classroom as well. So very much uh, rooting it in the existing frameworks and, you know, Rob and I were, were talking in advance of today's discussion as to where podcasting would lie within DigComp EDU. And I suppose we settled on uh, Competence 2.3 uh, managing, protecting and sharing digital resources. But in fact, what you're doing with podcasting actually could be found at various different points in, in, in the framework itself. Um, and indeed, it, within the primary context, um, as I support my students for them to go out and to implement our digital learning framework for primary schools in the primary school context, you can find it sitting into lots of the different um, domains within the two dimensions of teaching and learning and leadership and management. But when I work with the students, I kind of, I pitch it to them at the, the learner experience level within that domain. And then within MIE, um, of course, like everybody, we had to uh, respond we had to respond to the to the pandemic in an appropriate way. And to that end, um, our director of IT and e-learning, Dr. Alison Egan, uh, presented a paper for all of us to consider to work towards a kind of a more unified um, approach to how we were teaching online over the last number of months. And you see there, I just took a screen grab from the paper that she presented that was adopted by our leadership team that has been very successful um, from, from speaking with with students, we were combining different elements of learning to ensure that the students were getting um, synchronous and asynchronous delivery to support them as they moved to, to learn online. So, you know, um, obviously, I know we have H5P um, fans amongst us here, we would have incorporated that we really took our use of forums up a notch. But actually, it was the podcasting space that really interested me. And while I had done it before, I kind of took it to a, a, the next level this semester. So I suppose I saw this as an opportunity for me to look at what I was doing and, and to read into the context in which our students are now working and living. So if you're anything like me, you will um, listen to a lot of podcasts. I swear by them, to be honest with you. And I've, I've found them very useful where over the last couple of months, I've maybe struggled to engage with fiction texts or even the news. Um, it has been very, very difficult. To, so to escape to various different podcast channels uh, and, and, and options that are out there was something that I really enjoyed. And I, I realized from speaking to my students that they themselves also were in this space. And I surveyed my students in advance of semester one this year. And 52% of them told me that they were listening to at least four podcasts a week. So I suppose I started to realize then that there was an opportunity for, for me to, to, to direct my learning uh, or, or, or my teaching rather 
so that they're learning in, in the context of what I was doing with them in creative technologies would be reflective of how they themselves are living their lives and how they're engaging with material and the outside world. So how did we do it? Um, we looked at a number of different options and across our teacher education program, I would obviously, uh, within my uh, modules of creative technology, using technology within inquiry based learning, um, and indeed another module that I teach them on uh, communicative competence, so using technology to enhance how we communicate with the wider school community and in particular parents, we would look at an array of tools and I looked at how we could incorporate um, a selection of these within our Moodle page, again showcasing the use of it so that they would understand it themselves as a learner with the hope that they could then bring it into their practice as an educator um, and to try these things out on school placement and then ultimately when they end up into their own classroom. So. Um, in the first instance, we would have worked with Audacity, and that would have been something that um, Alison would have recommended in, in her paper and in, in the Tell Me About IT approach, and it worked really, really well. But I wanted to give, I suppose, more opportunities to showcase and house our podcast elsewhere. So we were plugging in and, and, and attaching our, our Audacity recordings um, within Moodle, but then we were also looking at the use of other tools and I would have explored that with the students as well. And I would say um, this has actually changed how I have interacted entirely with all of my students. And I have been showing the students how they can use Vokaroo, for example, very simple um, website vokaroo.com to just send me voice messages and I can send them voice messages in return in the hope that we can bridge the gap between um, uh, my home to theirs as they learn remotely. We've looked at opportunities for using Zoom to record audio, um, but the one that we, I think, were most successful in getting them to utilize and to experiment with was the use of Anchor.fm um, because it incorporates, obviously, um, so seamlessly into Spotify, which, which they are now one and the same. So that worked really well for us. We utilize then um, different types of podcasts. I've just used the graphic here from um, Anchor but I, I had them, the, the different recordings existed on different platforms, giving them opportunities to engage with them on whatever platform they so cho they were choosing to do. Um, and we had different types of podcasts that I broadly put into three different categories. I would say the first one was a Revisicast type podcasts where, um, you know, having done a lecture on the digital learning framework, I would give them a synopsis on what it was that we had looked at that day. Then I would have given them the opportunity to have like um, exposure to podcasts that were more like fireside chats where they would have normally been the type of lectures where I would have had a guest lecture come in. So um, I, I, I would have recorded it in that way and they could listen to it in their own time. And then finally, the type of lecture content that would not necessarily need to be delivered in um, a synchronous way. It would be referring, say, for example, to assignments, giving them an idea of what would be the expectations of the assignment, due dates, etc. So there, they were the opportunities um, that that I I, I, I took to, to utilize uh, podcasting. So what did we learn? Um, well, we learned that the students really enjoyed the use of podcasting and. Um, I did a midterm survey with them and then I did an exit survey with them last week when our teaching term ended and the podcasts were really well reviewed and across all of the different year groups and I thought it was interesting that the the, the second years seemed to uh, and their module is on inquiry based learning they seemed to really like that I was giving them an opportunity to try something that I they I wanted they themselves to try out in, in the classroom um the third year is kind of were reflecting upon the idea that it allowed them to review content in an, in an alternative way. So of course they all had become zombies over the last number of weeks, uh, withering away behind laptops. And it was a really nice thing to be able to give them an opportunity to go walk the dog, get a cup of coffee and to have me in their ear and they could continue their learning. But it allowed for, I suppose, them to account for how we're all living during COVID and, and their learning was changing as a result. Um, and again, the PMEs liked that, you know, this is reflective of their own interests anyway. So it was, it was, it was something that they enjoyed. Um, so I would have embedded it on Moodle, as I said, but I, I mean, I really would like 
at this stage, I mean, this was very much experimental over the last couple of months. I would like to um, be able to analyze, I suppose, the level of engagement within Moodle. So looking at plugins and everything going forward. But I suppose over the last couple of months, I did like the degree of flexibility that it gave the students, allowing them to listen on, on different on, on different channels, different platforms. So I suppose it's it's now, I suppose, putting it out there. How do you think it could work for you across the programs you're working in and, and, and the students you're working with to give it a go? And again, I just love to hear from anybody um, who is currently utilizing podcasts at whatever level to work with their students. Um, my Twitter contact or my Twitter handle rather is down below. Uh, reach out, get in contact. And again, if anyone has any questions or any suggestions in the chat, I'd love to hear from you.